Thanks, everyone. Uh, sounds like we're live. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, like she said, um, I'm going to be talking about extending Cilium with eBPF to expose HTTP golden metrics. So before I dive in, I just want to give you a little bit of background on me. Uh, I work at Solo. For those of you that aren't aware of Solo, they're a startup that uh, essentially do a, a big part of them is uh, managed Istio. So they, they do kind of Istio for larger deployments, um, multiple clusters, that kind of thing. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of networking challenges as a part of that. Um, before I was at Solo, I was at Nginx working on their service best solution, writing modules to help service their use case. Um, and, and I kind of jumped at the opportunity to be able to work um, in XDP to uh, essentially service this UDP redirection mechanism. Um, and I kind of took that, uh, I, I discovered kind of a passion for BPF, started thinking about how we might be able to do the same for TCP redirection and offload some of the responsibility off of what the proxy was doing at the time. Um, and ended up joining, joining Solo and they had um, some interesting kind of work with what was uh, kind of going on with, with kind of as the, the proxy is evolving, the, the role of eBPF is kind of really interesting there and I've been looking at what we might be able to do with eBPF uh, in terms of servicing metrics. So before I begin, I just wanted to give a quick shout out. Um, this document um, was really helpful getting started and has kind of served as the holy grail <laughs> um, in, in a way for, for BPF and XDP especially. Um, and it's just really awesome to see uh, the community evolve in terms of you know, uh, documentation and, and support and interest and, and all of that. And it's, it's really cool. I'm honored to be presenting in front of in front of you all today. So the agenda I have for you is essentially just talking about a background on, on kind of what we're trying to achieve as well as um, what's kind of been going on, what's, what's the current state of the world uh, for, for uh, golden metrics, HTTP metrics using BPF. Uh, going to talk about the concept and then uh, the execution of, of attempting to expose these metrics purely in, in BPF. So the background. So most of you are probably familiar with, with these golden metrics. Google defines it as if you can only focus on, on a certain set of metrics, you would want to kind of focus on these, the, the traffic, number of requests, um, errors in terms of response code, bucketed by 2xx, 3xx, and then um, latency, which is, uh, will end up being the most complex to support, which I'll talk about. It's a really interesting problem to solve. Um, and then saturation, which I'm not really going to be talking about too much today, just because it's kind of outside the scope of what I find interesting in, in these golden metrics in terms of kind of collecting, um, you know, data as, as networks are, or, or packets are, are flowing through the network. Um, and, and you can get it pretty easily through the Kubernetes metrics server um, or, or however you might get CPU utilization, memory utilization off of a Linux machine. And then I'm going to just show quickly um, how you might be able to export uh, something if you're using this architecture to, to you know, export it using Prometheus and integrate it with, with existing tooling. So when we were looking at Cilium, we noticed, um, for our use cases at least, that there were a couple gaps um, in terms of, for instance, like not being able to get like the number of bytes that were sent um, or, or kind of L7 traffic classification. We noticed that Cilium did have L7 metrics exposed, but you had to have a policy enforcement using that Envoy proxy in order to get it. And so um, we started thinking about how else we could kind of get these, get these metrics out of, out of Cilium or, or, you know, in a Cilium ecosystem, kind of get these metrics. So Pixie is doing really interesting work. It's, it's really cool what they, what they have going. They use, you know, as people have been talking about, K-probes. Um, they're, they're tracing these, these syscalls on entry and exit, collecting information, classifying the, the request and the response, as well as determining lat latency. Um, one interesting thing, though, is that they kind of, uh, they parse the Ethernet frame that's, that's getting sent and they, they send it to user space for, for processing, and that's where they do their latency calculation. Um, and it, it makes a lot of sense to be able to, to do that because you have a lot less restriction in terms of you know, um, what you can do. The verifier places a lot of restrictions there as well as it's outside the, the data path, so you're not adding extra latency from that calculation. So it makes sense, but there are potential like drawbacks of you know, if you're sending a bunch of events through a map to user space, you have potential like permissions um, if, if, if a bad actor were to kind of read the data on that map, um, they could potentially gain access to that data. Of course, there's, you know, when you're thinking about permissions, um, if they had permissions to read that map, they could probably kind of do their own tracing. So 
Um, you know, there, there's an argument to be made there. But also, when you're sending so many events to user space, um, you have the potential for kind of overflowing that, that centralized aggregator um, and potentially dropping events. So it's just kind of interesting to think about what we might be able to do in eBPF itself instead of kind of sending a bunch of data to, to user space. Um, so in terms of Cilium, we were looking at Cilium. Again, it's a, it's a really cool product, and, and it's really interesting how they kind of own the entire networking ecosystem inside of a cluster. You can imagine traffic coming outside of outside of the cluster itself or from another node or another local pod on the node you're, you're wanting to reference. All of those have different nuances that you have to kind of deal with um, in terms of tracking the, the network flowing through a system. And Cilium is really cool in that it manages all of this and it provides a, um, a, a essentially a t an attachment point where you can run your own custom BPF programs to add in your own custom functionality. So that's what we're going to be talking about, this custom data path. Um, and, it, and, it, and it does this through the use of BPF tail calls. So in terms of the concept of what we're trying to do, you guys are familiar with BPF. Um, you're familiar with, with what traditionally has been kind of done with it. And when I was kind of looking at it, um, it the way I kind of see it is when you're operating at these lower levels, um, when, you're, when you're trying to look at like the IP header, or TCP header, there's, a, there's a, you know, a kernel structure to be able to reference, and then you can just kind of get the offset in, uh, into that packet um, and, and expose whatever information you're wanting to user space. It also enables really interesting use cases. Um, say you're wanting to like alter the destination of traffic uh, to a sidecar that's wanting to operate differently based on the different protocols or something. It enables really interesting use cases. But as soon as you get to kind of HTTP, this is more traditionally um, you know, dealt with by user space applications. There's not a you know, there's no respective kernel structure that you can kind of reference in order to be able to operate on this, on this data. Um, so we have to fall back to kind of the RFC. You know, there's still a structure, but you're operating now on characters that you have to kind of iterate through in order to get that information rather than like a bitwise, you know, something efficient or something easily ac uh, accessible like a kernel structure. And there's an element of complexity that comes with, with trying to deal with the latency, the latency aspect of golden metrics. Um, so this is in a, like a simple example where you know, a T0 a client sends a, a request, the server receives it, calls any dependent backends, does any processing, and then it sends it back. Um, and we can say that the latency here is, is three units, whatever you're wanting to talk about. But a more useful example of latency is this. Um, for example, I, I know with Nginx, they send the response headers and the body separately. If you have a large response body, it's going to be fragmented. So you're not going to have one response per request. You're going to have to have a bit more of a, you know, you're going to have to track the state as multiple responses or, or packets are, are kind of sent in response to that request. So it's going to add some complexity. And how we're going to end up having to, you know, uh, support this is by essentially tracking the content links that's, that's sent in that response header, um, and then tracking the received content as it's coming in to be able to ensure that it's equal to that content link specified, just how HTTP kind of operates. In terms of how this can be executed, um, so again, going back, if you're look, wanting to look at something like the number of connections, this is really straightforward in, in eBPF, you can just kind of, you know, operate on, if it's a classifier program, on the, uh, the socket buffer, um, and then just kind of submit something user space. But there's not the same kind of, it's not as straightforward in HTTP. Um, so that's kind of what we're going we're gonna to try and solve here. So the idea here is that we're going to place two um, different BPF programs to help service the use case, both on the, on the, if we're per client, whatever we're trying to get metrics for, we would attach on the egress side, um, as well as the ingress side to, to First, on the, on the send side, the egress side, we're going to catch HTTP requests to submit that, to get that first kind of element of the golden metrics, the, the HTTP request, the number of requests. And then we're going to begin latency capture. And then on the response side, we're going to catch, ca catch that HTTP response to bucket the number the, in the response code into 2xx, 3xx, that kind of thing. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, determine the content link that's in that HTTP header and then track response, um, track the response um, so that we can ensure that what was received is equal to what is specified by, by the, what the server is sending. And then we're going to log that latency. So again, this, these are the, the golden metrics that we're going to kind of looking for, traffic, number of requests, error rate, and, and response time. <clears throat> 
So as it turns out, the number of requests is, is really straightforward. Um, if you're just operating on, on the request line of, of an HTTP request, you just look at get, you can see in the, the RFC, um, you can just support these, these different kind of methods. And then what's really nice is it's at the very beginning of the user data, so there's no complexity in, in being able to get this. You just essentially you know, check the, the character array at ze index zero, one, two. Um, it, it's really straightforward to get. Um, and then submitting to user space, you could just key it. What's, what's interesting to call out here is that when you're operating within like a Cilium, uh, the Cilium system, um, the destination address I've found is not necessarily reliable. For instance, if they're trying to redirect to um, an L7 proxy for policy enforcement, that destination address might get changed. So I had to key it based off of um, server identity, which is going to be, um, it's going to be consistent uh, when you're dealing with uh, when you're dealing with an egress program here. So that's the, that's the kind of key that we use, and then we use the client address. And then um, we have to choose a, a BPF map. So kind of iterating through, um, I started with a, with a hash map, which, which makes sense whenever you're kind of collecting metrics, but that has lock implications uh, because all the CPUs are going to be kind of, um, uh, kind of, you know, trying to add to that hash map at, at the same time. So there's the introduction of the CPU, the per CPU hash, but that has disadvantages in terms of the backend uh, gather um, that you have to do, which is you know, pretty straightforward, but still something to be aware of. There's also kind of a nuance that's interesting in that um, whenever a pod gets kind of restarted and, and there's a new pod that comes up with a different IP, because that key is, is using the identity and Cilium maintains that identity, um, essentially uh, you're going to have requests that were attributed to that last pod be, be attributed to the, the, the new pod that comes up. So it's, it's just kind of an interesting thing. If, if your granularity is on a workload level, that might not be too, too big of a deal or like a service level, but if you're wanting to kind of get an accurate gauge of which requests to go to which pod, that's going to be a problem. And that can be alleviated by the use of something like a, like a ring buff um, where you're just sending events uh, as they happen to some sort of collector, kind of like how Pixie do, does it. Um, so errors um, is going to be very similar. This is now operating on the response code. Again, it's very straightforward because you have the user data. Um, uh, and at the very beginning of the user data, if it's a HTTP response, you're going to have this you know, standard HTTP uh, response line. You can just check. You can essentially check for the HTTP string and then check for the, the number. Um, so the two and 200, and then, and then bucket it that way, and you can see a little bit of the code on the right, um, how simple it is to kind of check for that string, and then some code for, for submitting it to a map. So both of those are, are really straightforward to support. What, what's, um, oh, and then you can see kind of uh, the, something similar. Not exactly the same, because we're, we're operating on ingress now. It's now the source identity rather than the servers. Um, but, but it's still talking about like kind of the remote identity and then that destination address is the client. So latency is where a lot of the complexity actually comes in in supporting a solution like this of, of being able to do that calculation in eBPF itself. Um, so the complexity comes from on that receive side, uh, getting the content length header, which is anywhere in that response header itself, um, and then tracking the response body as, as these packets start flowing in. Um, so essentially, let's see, there's something that we're going to have, something like this, where we have a, a state that's maintained throughout the, the connection as the requests are going in, starting with, with essentially this, this start time that is, that is indicated by the egress program. Um, and then when we receive that first response, we're going to look for that content length um, string inside that header. And then as the receive, receive content is flowing in, we're going to essentially match it until we equal the content length, and then we're going to submit an event to, to user space. So the reason that this is so complex is because there is um, restrictions placed by the verifier to ensure that you know, the BPF program is, is safe to run. And in order to do that, it needs to evaluate instructions. And these instructions grow um, quite quickly when you're operating when you're trying to do something like this, as I'll kind of get into. But essentially, the complexity of trying to get that content length and that, that end of the header so that we know when the receive content starts, say that the response header and the response body share a packet, you need to know that boundary so you can accurately track um, that, that receive content that's coming in. Um, 
it, it adds some complexity. And then I was kind of thinking as I was creating this solution, um, I didn't you know, want to have any artificial restrictions. One benefit of passing to user space is that you don't really have any restrictions. You, can, you, know, you don't have that verifier uh, complexity limit. Um, so even though you know, this is only like a 200, header, 200 character header, response header, I wanted to be able to support more than that. So I have the code on the right if, in case anyone wants to try and read it, but that's just in case you want to try and parse it for later. Essentially, this is a first pass iteration of trying to check for headers that were, for the header that was coming in, the different lines, essentially look for the content length string. Um, and then when we find that match, we're, we're just going to essentially uh, look for the, the numbers associated with that content length so that we can add it into our state and be able to kind of accurately account for that. Um, uh, you know, pretty complex, but, but you'll kind of see how, how that worked out. So as I was trying to load this into the, the you know, load this into the kernel, um, I found that at 15 loop iterations, I had 131,000 instructions that were, you know, uh, that the verifier, the states essentially that the verifier verified. And then at 17 iterations, it was 570,000, so a 4x increase, and then a 19, I hit that million instruction limit. Um, and as you guys are probably aware, uh, at a million instructions, the, the verifier just kind of gives up and says that it's not going to continue working. So this clearly isn't um, a solution that, that works. Uh, there's no header that's going to be you know, useful that is 19 characters long. Um, so I had to kind of figure out in depth what was going on and try and get some efficiencies out of this code to be able to parse longer headers. Um, and and the, the tools that I worked with were, were that BPF prog load, the, essentially the, debo, the, the, the verbose um, verifier log was really helpful, as well as getting a debuggable kernel to be able to check um, the various states that the verifier was in uh, in order uh, at, at various execution points. Um, and then, as you'll see, uh, making use of BPF tail calls. So the reason that this um, verifier kind of ballooned in complexity was because, as you guys know, if statements are branches and the verifier, um, so the verifier needs to evaluate both of these branches whenever they occur to make sure both are safe to run. Um, and that adds to complexity, especially given the context of a loop. So these branches are going to be exacerbated every time you loop, and it's just going to balloon in terms of the number of instructions that need to get evaluated. State pruning does help in this scenario. Um, it, where essentially it'll prune a state if at a certain instruction it's seen the registers before, um, the register values before, but again, the, you saw how, how much the instruction, um, the number of instructions balloon, so it's not going to save us. So this is a reprised architecture that I came up with in order to be able to, to support this in, in BPF. Essentially, starting from the top left, if an egress program um, creates our start time and, and maintains some sort of header state, because we're going to have to maintain state across these different blocks. Um, we're going to have a base program that essentially parses the status, but then calls these other blocks. And a saving grace in all of this was the, the idea of using BPF tail calls to essentially reset the verifier state. For those of you that don't know, um, tail calls, when you, when you make it, essentially res resets. It's essentially, essentially a, an independent program, so that's going to reset the state that the verifier is in. Um, and, and as you go, kind of go through this, you have a header manager that calls, um, and the idea is to kind of uh, take away as much complexity as possible away from these parsers, because that's where most of the kind of ballooning happens. You have tail calls, um, then to the header parser, and then the content length parser. Um, in order to get that content length um, uh, string, or content length number uh, into our state. So the header parser is going to find the end of the header, which is going to create a bound for, uh, for where to look for that content length string and then the content length header is going to be found inside of that. So the BPF tail calls helped a lot, um, but another efficiency was just kind of the, using the, the, the verbose um, verifier output. Uh, at, so this is kind of a reprised uh, bit of code that had less branches, but you could still see at 30 iterations, so we've made some improvements that we had 514,000 instructions. Um, and so it just kind of took some time to iterate through and, and look at uh, why this was happening. So I bolded register 3, and as you can see, register 3 cor correlates to this match variable. And it was saying that this match could be up to, it, here it was 67, even though the purpose of this match variable is to make sure, or is to check that 
the essentially the, the, the length of the match string when we're looking for the content length string is if it's equal to 14, we know that we've, we've found, our, found our match. So the fact that it's 67 means that the verifier isn't aware that this is, you know, is in a state that we can actually get to. So this is a good example of us needing to add explicit boundaries in order to prevent um, the verifier from kind of ballooning that. So after I added a boundary here, that, that verifier complexity went down to 18,000 instructions, so a 97% decrease in, in terms of the size. So using this reprised architecture and, and finding some of those, those that, that increased complexity um, or, and, and finding, some of the, finding some of those unbounded variables, um, I was able to get a content length parser of 600 characters per program and then a header parser of 1,024 characters. Um, that was just limited by memset as soon as you go above that, that built-in memset wasn't, wasn't working. I'm sure you could get it more. Um, but my thinking is that because these are now independent programs, um, tail call, you can actually tail call itself. So this 600 character can just keep iterating as long as if you have a massive header um, and be able to actually service any kind of use case. You could see if you had like a jumbo frame, it would take like 15 tail calls. Um, I have a slide at, after this that I, that I didn't actually include just because of time that goes into kind of the latency implications, the, the you know, performance of, of these tail calls. And, and it's been improving um, throughout the kernels, but that, that is a consideration. But with this uh, architecture, you should be able to support it. Um, and, and this is kind of just a, a review of, of what we're kind of doing here. So I've, I've blocked the content length. We, we get this content length header as the packets are going in, and then as the received content is flowing in, um, we just match it against that content length. That's the responsibility of that receive base prog. Uh, and then as soon as it's, it's matched, we just send, send an event to, to user space. So then, uh, now we have um, exported metrics. So if you guys want to check it out, um, Bumblebee uh, is a really cool tool for being able to work with, with uh, these kinds of, of programs and be able to actually visualize these metrics. And Prometheus, it just takes data that, that is existing in maps um, and, and essentially export them so they're, they're viewable. Um, you can see uh, the number of requests, the response codes, as well as the, the latency. Um, that, that gets exported. Right now, the, the keys are the client adder, that 10.0.0.97, um, which you can see at the, at, in the middle box is, correlates to this L7 metrics pod, which I was just running a curl request from, and then that server identity, which, which Cilium maintains a, a state of. So you can imagine kind of translating these keys into whatever granularity you want um, and, and kind of using Cilium's kind of built-in uh, mechanism uh, it, Cilium's built-in state to be able to kind of translate it to, to whatever you, you'd like to do. So there are some limitations to this approach. Um, it doesn't right now support HTTP pipelining. It's, it's, you know, it, it uses the fact that there's one response per request, which I'm sure could be improved. It's just not something that this architecture supports. It's not supporting transfer encoding chunked, um, and, and it doesn't work with, with TLS uh, since the data is all encrypted. Pixie has a really cool mechanism. Um, and the previous talk was talking about you know, U probes and, and being able to hook in there in order to support um, encrypted data. That's, that's really cool, and Pixie's doing some really cool work there in order to support that. But uh, in conclusion, um, there are quite a few considerations whenever you're trying to kind of move responsibility away from user space into BPF, and it's very difficult to do, especially with the complexity limits that the verifier places. But um, being able to uh, check out that verbose verifier as well as utilize uh, BPF tail calls. Um, we are able to move solutions into the kernel and be able to essentially like service more complex use cases, which is exciting if we're wanting to kind of do things more, you know, dynamically. Um, and but there are you know there's there's both pros and cons to this. You're not having to iterate the entire packet in order to support this, um, but you are adding kind of latency to the data path by, by doing this, um, which is you know, non-zero and is something definitely to consider. Um, but the result is, is golden metrics done purely in, in eBPF and then exported to user space just for, um, you know, uh, just for Prometheus, essentially integrating with Prometheus tooling. Um, but that is it. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, yeah, appreciate it. <laughs>